was not um, easy to hide somewhere because I want to hide, <laughs> but it's not easy. Um, Your Eminence, Metropolitan Methodius, dear Father Tom Fitzgerald, my esteemed professors, beloved students, brothers and sisters, and dear friends. Because I do have friends. <laughs> they are here with me. They, uh, I'm really moved and honored tonight. And um, I'm particularly honored by the invitation uh, that Father Tom insisted so much for years. And um, if I have not uh, accepted so far, um, it's for evident reasons, certainly, that I don't want to comment, but because also of my heavy schedule and program that I have not only in France or in Europe, but in other places in the mission of the Mother Church, the Ecumenical Patriarchate. So, being tonight in this uh, prestigious institution that I left 25 years ago fills me with particular joy and honor, let us repeat once again. It is fitting that this event is named after Patriarch Athenagoras, not only because he founded Hellenic College Holy Cross 75 years ago, but because his ministry had a tremendous impact on love, charity, and ecumenical activities for decades after his passing. The Holy Spirit is always at work in the church, empowering those committed to Christ to put into place a foundation in one generation that supports and launches the ministry of the next. Patriarch Athenagoras put the foundation for this college in place and for decades graduates of Hellenic College Holy Cross have served the world well as they have followed in the footsteps of Christ. They impacted their communities throughout, through Christian service and leadership, honoring our founding father in the process. Upon this foundation, Hellenic College Holy Cross students will continue to build and make a difference in our world. I'm also really humbled to return to Holy Cross this year because it was 25 years ago that I graduated from this sacred institution. As I remember my time here, I'm thankful for all the good things in this Holy Hill. A sense of community, the camaraderie of fellow students and the mentoring relationship between professors and students. I was uh, encouraged to embrace academic discipline while seeking the connection with the mysteries of the Orthodox tradition. I came as a stranger and I left as a brother. And I really have come home tonight. I'm here to share with you some thoughts about ecumenism based on the ministry of the Ecumenical Patriarchate. For those of you who are not yet familiar with the term ecumenism, it is simply the aim for unity among all Christians throughout the world, the aim for visible unity 
in the one holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. Ecumenism is not a new idea. It's not a construction of modern men. It is, however, a necessity for this generation to address. And the word ecumenical, in its original form, simply means all the inhabited earth. Therefore, the ministry of the ecumenical throne is worldwide in its influence. The ecumenical throne embraces the tradition of being an example of, for the world in its conduct with others empowered by the guidance of the Holy Spirit, the enlightenment of the scripture, and the continuity and discernment of tradition. However, the ecumenical patriarchate is not alone in this ministry. His Old Holiness, the Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew, once said, Apostle Paul wrote to the Christians living in Corinth 2,000 years ago, God has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Indeed, he has given it to all of us, diplomats and clergy, leaders and followers, making all of us to be his ambassadors of peace and reconciliation. As I will highlight in a few minutes, ecumenical activity can be traced throughout the history of humanity. In fact, God is the first ecumenist, so to speak, but pleas for unity have also sprung from the lips of Christ, the apostles, and St. John Chrysostom in the 4th century, St. Gregory Palamas in the 14th century, Patriarch Athenagoras and Patriarch Demetrius in the 20th century, and Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew in this century, and many others, too numerous to list. Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew recalled this tradition of ministry to our minds when he said, according to St. John Chrysostom, God is always in personal dialogue with human beings. God always speaks through prophets and apostles, through saints and mystics, even through the natural creation itself. For the heavens declare the glory of God, and dialogue between God and mankind is possible because of the incarnation of Christ. That is why it is impossible to define the true nature of dialogue outside of theology. True dialogue is a gift from God to mankind and a fundamental experience of life. Dialogue enriches and it is the basis of theosis as the church fathers have shown us. Whoever refuses dialogue remains impoverished. The ecumenical throne takes uh, St. John Chrysostom words seriously and translates them into action in the world of today. Whereas some would limit dialogue to the Roman Catholic Church or a small circle of Christians, the ecumenical throne has looked beyond dividing humanity into separated groups. And therefore, we speak not only with the Roman Catholics, but also with the Muslims and the Jews and other world religious leaders. Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew traces interreligious dialogue with Muslims back hundreds of years and reminds us that during the 14th century, a dialogue was conducted between the great Christian theologian and Saint Archbishop Gregory Alamas and distinguished representatives of Islam. Of course, they did not entirely agree, but one of the representatives of Islam stated that for him, the time, the time should come when mutual understanding between the followers of the two religions would exist. As Sir Gregory agreed to this statement, 
and wish that time would come soon. Today, we are able to wish, and we do wish wholeheartedly, for this to be fulfilled in our days. We, too, can also wish wholeheartedly for this to be fulfilled in our days, for we have witnessed the great tragedy that has befallen the world as a result of the attacks of 9-11 and the subsequent decade of war after centuries of intolerance, misunderstanding, <coughs> and evil. According to Ecumenical Patriarch observes, we approach dialogue in a spirit of love, sincerity, and honesty. This respect, dialogue implies equality, which in turn implies humility. Honesty and humility dispel hostility and arrogance. The Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew leaves the honesty and humility that works towards dispelling hostility and arrogance, but with a passionate understanding of the truth found in his deep-rooted faith. He explains, this is why we explicitly declare that interreligious dialogue does not take place either for participants to enter into alliances with members of other religions or for them to badger others into conceding to their beliefs. They take place rather for a cessation of religious intolerance, for the triumph of mutual understanding, and for the establishment of certainty into the good intentions of both sides, respectful of each person's cultural background and freedom of religious choice. Other notable ecumenical interreligious dialogues that the Ecumenical Patriarchate has engaged in include Lutherans and Reformed, of course, the Oriental Orthodox, although there are still difficulties that we are trying to overcome. There is also a dialogue with the Anglican Church, with the Old Catholics, and um, we are still trying to apply also the decisions which were made a few years ago. Ecumenical relations are clearly an ongoing process. For more than 30 years, there has been dialogue between the Ecumenical Patriarchate and Judaism, and also Islam, on a purely academic consultations level. And the dialogue continues today. Multilateral interreligious meetings have been organized as a result of the initiatives of the Ecumenical Patriarchate for many years. There have been uh, two conferences, core sponsored and organized with uh, the Appeal of Conscience Foundation with Rabbi Yaku Schneier on peace and tolerance, as well as uh, the conference in Brussels in 2001 following the aftermath of 9-11. And the Bra Brussels Declaration reflects the Ecumenical Patriarch's long-held belief that war in the name of religion is war against religion. And that is the will of God for peace to prevail in the world. It is important to review these dialogues and to make distinction that we do not coerce another to join our church, neither do we dilute the truth of our faith. The ecumenical throne desires to be in unity with Christians and in harmony with those who do not choose to follow Christ. In approaching others with whom we differ, the path 
the ecumenical throne has chosen is what ecumenical patriarch Athenagoras envisioned. In remembering his wisdom and guidance, ecumenical patriarch Bartholomew said that we affectionately recall how ecumenical patriarch Athenagoras, <coughs> an extraordinary leader of profound vision and ecumenical sensitivity, a tall man with piercing eyes, would resolve conflict by inviting the embattled parties to meet, saying to them, come, let us look one another in the eyes. This means that we must listen more carefully, look one another more deeply in the eyes, and as Sanilos of Ankira wrote, you are of the world within the world, Look inside yourself, and there you will see God in the whole of creation. Each of us comprises a living icon of the divine creator. And we are, furthermore, always, whether we know it or not, closer to one another in more days than we are distant from one another closer than we might ever suspect or even imagine. During the lifetime of Patriarch Athenagoras, many remarkable things took place which ushered in the dialogue of love. The Orthodox Church and the Roman Catholic Church lifted the anathemas in 1965 from the Great Schism and opened toward dialogue between the two sister churches. Patriarch Demetrius succeeded Patriarch Athenagoras and continued the work of unity with the Roman Catholic Church and also with Orthodox churches through Pan-Orthodox conferences. Patriarch Demetrius established official theological dialogue between the Orthodox and Roman Catholic Church on November 30th, 1979 and he traveled to Rome to meet face to face with the Pope of Rome, John Paul II, in 1987. The two leaders participated in a ceremony and prayer in St. Peter's Basilica, reciting together in Greek in the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed, without the Philiopter. And Patriarch Demetrius also engaged in dialogue with the Anglican Church receiving two Archbishops of Canterbury at the Ecumenical Patriarchate. During the 40th anniversary year of the lifting of the anathemas, Pope of Rome returned the relics of St. John Chrysostom and St. Gregory the Theologian to the Ecumenical Patriarchate. In 2008, the Ecumenical Patriarch traveled to Rome to participate in a service in a 16 chapel. Were these gestures an answer to the prayer we have been praying every Sunday since the time of St. John Chrysostom for peace in the whole world, for the stability of the Holy Church of God, and for the unity of all? Let us pray to the Lord. Could we resolve many of the conflicts we encounter by looking into the eyes of one another more deeply and working toward peace. This is exactly what I expressed to His Holiness the Pope of Rome, Benedict XVI, during the Feast of St. Peter and Paul just uh, last year, while representing His Holiness Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew. And I said that we feel that our churches would be infinitely more efficient and credible to the mission if they were bound together and were able to deliver a message of hope. The idea of achieving peace in a world is at times a motivating hope, and at another times an overwhelming proposition. The population of the earth is approaching 7 billion people, and the Christian population is thought to be 
2.1 billion. It is hard to imagine how any individual or church leader can positively impact that many human beings and perhaps even more difficult unite over 2 billion Christian believers. We must have a vision that guides us to see ourselves and others in the way God desires. He has provided the scripture, tradition, icons, and role models for us to gain insight into the heart of dialogue. Let us now turn to examining the scripture to see if we can discern how one person in seven billion can begin to make a difference for peace in our world today. 2,000 years ago, the world population is estimated to have been 170 million. Yet, God's plan for the proclamation of the good news of Christ's sacrificial work involved just 120 people who were empowered through the Holy Spirit. This gives us great hope for our work in this generation. Just weeks before the Holy Spirit descended at Pentecost, Christ prayed for the unity of all his disciples. Why was unity on the heart of Christ on that night? Jesus knew and told them on the eve of his crucifixion, all of you will be made to stumble because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. He was preparing to pour out his life for his disciples and also for those who would become believers as a result of their testimony. As was pre predicted in scripture, the act of the crucifixion scattered the sheep for a time. But 50 days after the resurrection, they were together in one room praying when the Holy Spirit descended and they emerged into the world to bear fruit and multiply the faith. In the Garden of Eden, many millenniums earlier, Adam and Eve were sent out into the world to be fruitful and multiply. Unfortunately, they were sent into the world because of their sin and even in their departure from the garden, they, like the early church, were not abandoned. God maintained the relationship and had already provided the plan to restore humanity. The Ecumenical Thrones Ministries in Ecumenical and Interreligious Dialogue are two different unique commitments which can be illustrated by the way God interacted with Adam and Eve and with the serpent after their sinful choices. In Genesis chapter 3, we see the fateful day unfold. The serpent tempts Eve with a review of God's prohibition of eating certain fruit. This temptation leaves her with questions about the Creator. Once she is deceived, she eats of the fruit. Then she convinces Adam to try to, and Adam chooses to follow suit. Suddenly, they realize their condition, they become afraid and hide from God. Let's focus on what happens next. God was the party wronged in the eating of the fruit, but he left his throne to seek out those who defied him. He wanted to see Adam and Eve face to face, and he did not arrive in the garden pronouncing anathemas, condemning or accusing. He simply asked Adam, where are you? And God did not attack them. He tried to understand what happened. And God asked, 
Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? Adam blamed Eve, and Eve blamed the serpent. God surely knew every detail already without having to ask any other created being. So why did he choose to speak with them face to face? How did he resolve the dilemma while keeping his relationship with them intact? God extended his love to them through his presence. Like Aaron, all of humanity can at times feel afraid. This is probably most often the case where ecumenical and religious dialogue is concerned, where we meet with others who have a different belief than ours, who can be afraid, afraid that they will not accept us, afraid that they will try to rule over us, afraid that we cannot convince them to be more like us. These possibilities leave us feeling vulnerable before the other. It also stands to reason that the other feels much the same way in our presence. When considering future ministry activities with ecumenism and the religious dialogue, the ecumenical throne keeps love as the motivation for communication. In fact, without love, dialogue holds little hope of bearing fruit. Our ecumenical patriarch loves others enough to go to them, even to those who have wronged him. He desires to meet with the other face to face, and he does not approach them with condemnation, but seeks to understand. The ecumenical throne has a rich history in reaching out to meet the needs of the other through witness, service, and love. Many confuse loving gestures, openness to dialogue and understanding the other as weakness or wrong heresy. Yet, when we examine God's approach to the sin of Adam and Eve, we get another perspective. There is a difficult balance between approaching another in dialogue without coercing them to change their point of view. There is a great temptation to define love through acquiescing your own standards and truth. And it is nearly impossible to remain in faith without either trying to overtake another or have them dominate your freedom of choice without their beliefs. In the garden, God struck all the right balances. His love for the individuals remained constant throughout the confrontation. Yet, God did not excuse their sin, nor did he waver in his knowledge of truth to appease and agree with them in their deception. This is the essence of ecumenical and religious dialogue. Approach without coercion, love without acquiescence, and faith without domination. When these uh, words are struck, there are loving gestures, understanding, and hope. As God modeled love for us in the garden, we know that it is possible to love another enough to allow them the freedom to choose their thoughts, actions, beliefs, and words. Dear brothers and sisters, the ecumenical throne has taken many steps to affirm these freedoms for people of all faiths. Yet, the world is still a dangerous place, particularly for minority religions. 
Why hasn't human communication improved in light of increasing ecumenical and religious dialogue in the churches and tolerance and diversity education in secular <coughs> society? What is the disconnection? Ecumenical Petiak Athenagoras of blessed memory once said, I do not deny that there are differences between the churches, but I say that we must change our way of approaching them. And the question of method is in the first place a psychological or rather a spiritual problem. For centuries there have been conversations between theologians and they have done nothing except to harden their positions. Of course, this is not to say that theologians are bad for the ecumenical movement. In fact, just the opposite is true, but there are limitations. True ecumenical and interreligious, interreligious faith dialogue occurs not only in the synods, conferences, theological meetings, and communication with the religious and political leaders. It, is all, it also occurs within each Orthodox household. Archbishop Yakovos of blessed memory once stated, all of us believe that ecumenical movement must be brought down from the level of the ecumenists to the level of the people. From the complex terminology used by theologians to language understood by the faithful. From the pulpit to the pew of the believer. From the pages of ecumenical literature to the lips of the readers. Before our movement can it become truly ecumenical, it must not only be presented objectively, but understood subjectively. In order to achieve this, however, we must take every effort to bring together the faithful of our member churches so that they may really know each other. It is difficult to figure out how to achieve Archbishop Yakovos' desire for individuals to participate in the work of ecumenism. God's ways in men's ways can be very different. Isaiah puts this into perspective. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. How do we, as Orthodox Christians, reach for the higher thoughts and interact every day with those who differ from us or even with those we feel have wronged us? It is not enough to grant others the freedoms of will and expression. We must do these things consistently but there is more, there is love. It is well known that when St. John the Evangelist grew old and was unable to walk, they carried him to church. And there he only admonished, brethren, let us love one another. How are you supposed to lovingly approach a Roman Catholic or a Muslim, or a Protestant, or an Anglican. Saint Isaac of Syria set the goal when he said, what is the sign that a man has attained to purity of heart? And when does a man know that his heart has entered into purity? When he sees all men as good, and none appears to him to be unclean and defiled. Then, in truth, his heart is pure. 
This idea is a lot easier to talk about than to live. But with each passing day, <coughs> the necessity to do so grows greater. There is, however, an important parable that Christ has used as a model for interacting with others that inspires St. Isaac's idea. Let us turn our attention to the parable of the Good Samaritan. Christ used the story to illustrate who our neighbor is in reference to the law of love. Jews and Samaritans did not get along. Each thought the other was wrong in their stewardship of the faith, but they interacted personally in business. Therefore, when Christ used a Samaritan in this uh, parable, the Jews would not have expected him to be heroic or noble. The astonishment of someone so unlikely to do the will of God must have gotten their attention. In the parable, after a Jewish priest and a Levite passed by, a man who had fallen victim to robbers, a Samaritan man, saw him. Christ said the Samaritan came and there he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandages, he bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn and took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, take care of him, and whatever more you spent, when I come again, I will repay you. In this parable, we may have the answer to our question about what a North Dutch Christian should do to love his neighbor. The first step the Samaritan took was that he came to the man, approaching another Territory takes courage. Once in the presence of the man, the Samaritan could see the man in his desperate need, and that created within him compassion for the man's circumstances. Those who saw the man from a distance were not moved to compassion, but the Samaritan came face to face with the man in the Samaritan was moved to act. Using his own animal, the Samaritan transported the man to the inn. When they arrived, the Samaritan involved others in caring for the man and sacrificed what is thought to be two days' wages to pay for his continued treatment for about three and a half weeks. The generosity of the Samaritan went even further in promising to pay for any additional costs for the man after the initial payment for care was expended. These last few gestures involve hands-on, face-to-face participation in the life of another. It takes commitment to move from compassion to service and from there to sacrificing our personal resources to heal another. In the Conference of European Churches, which is an organization, as you know, more than 20, 120 churches that I have the honor to preside, Christian churches of Anglican, Orthodox, and Protestant tradition try to commit themselves to serve God by serving the other. So this is possible. And dialogue is not only the exchange of words, it is also the exchange of gift where God stands in the middle. The ecumenical throne's approach to dialogue reflects the truth found in this parable and cannot be overstated. 
Dialogue is a necessity. And however, the application of ecumenical dialogue with your neighbor is much broader than the divisions humanity has created under the influence of uh, the great separator devil. Consider what St. Gregory the Theologian said, godly love cannot be perfect unless a man love his neighbor also. Under which name must be in that, in, in, included not only those who are connected with us by friendship or neighborhood, but absolutely all men with whom we have a common nature whether they be foes or allies, slaves or free. Given the observation of St. Gregory, we are able to see that the constructs of ecumenism, ecumenism and interreligious dialogue are helpful as descriptive tools, but ultimately they have too the potential to divide us from others. Let's now look at three contemporary models of how to dis demonstrate the love of God to people with whom we agree and to who those with whom we disagree. First, the discussion of Petya Kathinavoras would be complete without considering his role in 19, December 1965, lifting of anathemas between the Orthodox and the Roman Catholic Churches. Although he would uh, be roundly criticized from a variety of perspectives, Patriarch Athenagoras reached out to the Pope of Rome, Paul VI. After hearing, he would be in Jerusalem in 1963, and they met there face to face embraced and spoke privately. The Pope offered the ecumenical patriarch a chalice, which symbolizes hope for the future communion. And notice that the ecumenical patriarch, who was in a position of feeling wronged after the great schism, 1054, made the first move. There is a biblical precedent, precedent for doing so in Matthew 5, 24. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar, and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Petriarch Cathinagoras in the unbroken apostolic succession of Andrew, remember that his brother, Peter, had something against him. And he sought him out, met face to face, and they jointly began to heal the wounds of nearly a millennium. The next contemporary example involves Archbishop Iakovos, who blessed memory. And he serves as an example of becoming actively involved in healing the wounds of his brothers in humanity who were suffering during the American Civil Rights Movement in the 1960s. He stated, Orthodoxy is a religion and theology that places no boundaries or barriers along the way of those who reach for happiness in unity, in peace, and injustice. Orthodoxy will one day, and hopefully soon, rediscover its essential oneness and disable the hunger for power, ethnic superiority, secularism, which leads to other ambitions. Orthodoxy must definitely identify itself as a religion that leans over all people with genuine compassion and declare that its chief concern is to gather 
and unify all those who drifted away from Christian truth. To this end, Archbishop Yakovus marched side by side with Dr. Martin Luther King. This gesture of love and solidarity was captured in a photograph appearing on March 26, 19, in March 26, 1965, Life magazine cover, creating an image for us as Orthodox to be fearless when standing with others in their time of need. The last example of love in action that creates hope for humanity comes to us from outside the Orthodox Church. In October 2006, Charles Carl Roberts, a man who was uh, distraught and angry with God over the loss of his daughter, entered an Amish schoolhouse near Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and shot 10 girls and then turned the gun on himself. Five of these girls and the shooter died. That very afternoon, the families of those whose children had been murdered began to let the family of the shooter know that they forgave him. They did not stop there. They invited the murderer's mother to the funeral of one of the little girls whose life had been taken by her son. And the Amish community reached out to the Roberts family in an attempt to comfort them and also attended Mr. Roberts' funeral. They set up a charitable fund for the Roberts family, demonstrating their openness to working alongside the family of a man who forever changed that Amish community in much the same way as the Good Samaritan gave of his earnings and walked alongside the injured man to Jericho. The Amish gave of their resources to aid the healing of others. The Ecumenical Throne seeks to inspire peace unity and tolerance for all seven billion people on earth and consider all of humanity to be our neighbors. As we love one, our neighbor, we will go to meet them, sit with them and talk face to face. We will seek to understand and be moved to compassion. We recognize that the Holy Spirit through scripture and tradition always guides us towards love, forgiveness, and unity, not hatred, separation, and division. His Holiness Ecumenical Patrick Bartholomew has followed in apostolic succession on his path toward Christian witness and service to the Ecumenical Thrones Ecumenical and Interfaith Ministries. And he has said that through the centuries, we have learned that coexistence is only the beginning of the process of engagement. If we are to enjoy peace in place of war, prosperity instead of decline, freedom instead of oppression, we must move the dialogue beyond tolerance and even respect. We must recognize in the face of the other hindered self, one who shares with us the deepest aspirations and needs of humankind. In the end, you may never know whether you are the Good Samaritan or the injured man in this life, but if you approach others in love and service, you will receive as great a healing as the injured man in Christ's parable. It is my heartfelt desire that all of us in this room this evening would strive to achieve what uh, His Eminence Archbishop Demetrius, that I thank uh, from the bottom of my heart for 
giving me the opportunity and the blessings of being here tonight. I'll climb as a priority for Orthodox at his enthronement on September 18, 1999. In reflecting on Ephesians 4.16, he stated, just as we are called to one hope that belongs to our call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all, who is above all and through all and in all of us. This is precisely the reason why we feel our duty to stress, to stress the need for unity and peace among us. Without fear or hesitation, we are invited, beloved brothers and sisters, to set aside difference, misunderstanding or conflict that could create distances among us. Distances that shake the unity and drive away the peace of God. Nothing should jeopardize the great and divine gifts of unity and harmony, of uh, unanimity and communal accord. The season of great and holy land that we are observing now is a time that distances his eminence speaks about that can be bridged. If we have been wronged by another, we can seek them out as God did in the garden. If we see someone who is hurt and overlooked by others, we can approach them with love, bind up their wounds, and take steps to care for them as the Good Samaritan did. If we come to the altar and remember our brother or sister has something against us, we can come near them and reconcile our differences. It is love that sustains us in our effort to dialogue with others. And it is love that propels us to seek to live in unity with all Christians and in harmony with the rest of the world. In conclusion, please allow me allow our minds and hearts, and hearts to recollect the words received by Diognetus 18 centuries ago. And when you love him, you will be an imitator of his goodness. And do not be surprised to hear that a man can become an imitator of God. He can because God wills it. Thank you very much.